Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering the care of the patient with immune disorders. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video, give it a thumbs up. You're going to love the video, so go ahead and do it now so you don't forget. Subscribing to my channel if you haven't done so already, and don't forget, I'm now offering Next Generation NCLEX reviews, okay? I'm offering Next Generation NCLEX reviews and one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions, but I book very quickly. So make sure you reserve your spot now by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out the audio lessons I have available. Now, before we get started, as always, um, I wanna start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, go ahead and fast forward. If you are, close your eyes by your head unless you're operating heavy machinery. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for allowing us this time and opportunity to go over uh, nursing topics. Father God, I pray for every single viewer and listener right now. I ask that you please help them to understand the material that's going to be covered, Father God. I ask that you help them to study, give them the energy to study, Father God, help them to be more discipline to study and Lord I ask that you please help them to understand the rationales as they're studying help them to understand these rationales and to be able to apply those same concepts the next time they see them father God I ask that you please pour a special blessing over not only the watcher and the listener and the viewer but the people who are supporting them their support system their village the people who are rooting them on and telling them that they can do it I ask that you please bless them as well Lord thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you'll continue to do for us in Jesus Christ we pray Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. A female client arrives at the health clinic and tells the nurse that she was just bitten by a tick and would like to be tested for Lyme disease. The client tells the nurse that she moved the tick and flushed it down the toilet. Which of the following actions are most appropriate? One, refer the client to, for a blood test immediately. Two, inform the client that there's no test available for Lyme disease. Three, tell the client that testing is not necessary unless arthralgia develops. Or four, instruct the client to return in four to six weeks to be tested because testing before this time is not reliable. What do you think the answer is? And guys, the correct answer is number four. Come back in four to six weeks um, to be tested. So what happens is the body is not um, able to make those antibodies yet. So if you test before the four to six weeks, the result's not going to be reliable. But after that time, there's been enough time for the body to make those antibodies that they can be detected. And so that's why they need to come um, after four to six weeks. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, refer them for a blood test immediately. Again, it's not reliable. You gotta wait four to six weeks. Two, inform the client that there's no test available for Lyme disease. Yes, there is. Three, tell the client that testing isn't necessary unless arthralgia develops. Arthralgia may not develop for months and months and months. So what you gonna wait to get tested? And what if it doesn't develop? So that makes no sense. So number four is the correct answer choice. Following diagnosis of stage one Lyme disease, the nurse would anticipate that which of the following would be part of the treatment plan for the client? One, no treatment unless symptoms develop. Two, a three-week course of ant uh, oral antibiotic therapy. Three, oatmeal, daily oatmeal bath for two weeks. Or four, treatment with IV administered antibiotics. And guys, the correct answer, and this is typically um, what is prescribed, is gonna be two, is gonna be a three-week course of oral antibiotic therapy. That's the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong choices. One, no treatment unless symptoms develop. Absolutely not, okay? When it comes to Lyme's disease, it's um, all about preventative measures and early treatment. So one is false. Three, daily oatmeal bath for two weeks, that's crazy, what's that gonna do? And then choice four, treatment with IV administered antibiotics. That often is done, but that's done in the later stages. If you go back to the question, it says the patient's in what? Stage one. So number two would be the correct answer choice. By the way, guys, um, I know sometimes I, I may go quickly over the choices. If I'm going too quickly, just press pause and you can always rewind, okay? A Club Scout leader who's a, who is a nurse preparing a group of Cub Scouts for an overnight camping trip instructs the Scouts about the methods to prevent Lyme disease. Which statement by one of the Cub Scouts indicates a need for further instructions? One, I need to bring a hat to wear during the trip. Two, I should wear long sleeve tops and long pants. Three, I should not use insect repellents because it will attack the ticks. 
Four, I need to wear closed toe shoes and socks that can be pulled over my pants. And guys, the correct answer is number three. The reason the correct answer is number three, if you go back to the question, the question said, which one needs further instructions? Whenever a question says, which one needs further instructions? Or which one needs follow-up? Or which one needs clarification? What they're really asking you is, which one is the wrong answer choice? And here, number three is the wrong answer choice, saying that you're not gonna use insect repellents because it, atta it attracts the ticks. Absolutely not, you want it to, repel the ticks and that's what it does matter of fact you don't only put insect repellent on your skin you put it over your clothes too where the ticks you know may may uh, possibly land or hide so absolutely you're going to use insect repellent on your skin and on the clothes choice number one two and three are all things that you absolutely must do to protect um the skin from um a tick bite and let me add one more thing to it one th something you want to teach the patients you know if they're going camping or about prevention you want to teach them to try to stay away from like wooded areas or areas with thick or heavy underbrush okay because that's where the ticks like to hang out the client with acquired immunodeficiency syndrome is diagnosed with cutaneous Kaposi sarcoma. Based on this diagnosis, the nurse understands that this has been confirmed by which of the following? One, swelling in the genital area. Two, swelling in the lower extremities. Three, punch biopsy of cutaneous lesions. Or four, appearance of reddish blue lesions noted on the skin. And guys, the correct answer is three, biopsy. Go back to the question and the question's asking us, how's it confirmed? By a biopsy where they literally uh, remove a portion of that area and they'll test it, they'll look at it under a microscope. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, swelling in the genital area. That absolutely may happen, but it doesn't confirm and the question's asking us, how do we confirm? Choice two, swelling in the lower extremities. Also, that can happen. By the way, choices one and two, this happens um, during the late stages, but it absolutely can happen. But the question is not asking us for clinical manifestations. The question is asking us about how we confirm. So it's not one or two. And then choice four, appearance of reddish blue lesions noted on the skin. Again, that is a clinical manifestation, absolutely. But guess what? It does not confirm the disease. What confirms it is actual the actual biopsy. So that's why number three is the correct answer choice. The nurse prepares to give a bath and change the bed linens on a client with cutaneous carp Kaposi sarcoma lesions. The lesions are open and draining a scant amount of serous fluid. Which of the following would the nurse incorporate in the plan during the bathing the client? One, wearing gloves. Two, wearing a gown and gloves. Three, three, wearing a gown, gloves, and a mask, or four, wearing a gown and gloves to change the bed linens and gloves only for the bath. And guys, the correct answer is gonna be two, wearing a gown and gloves. So remember, we do this um, when we expect to come in contact with soiled items, such as like um, a draining wound or ileostomy, things like that, right? But look at the other wrong, look at the wrong choices. One, wearing a glove, wearing gloves, that's not enough. You're changing, let me go back to the question. It says that you're gonna be changing the bed linens and there are open and draining scant amount of serous fluid. So these are bodily fluids as you're changing, changing the linens. So you also need to be wearing um, a gown. So one's not enough. Two is the correct answer, the gown and gloves. Look at three, wearing a gown, that's good. Wearing the gloves, that's good. And a mask. When would we add the mask? We would add the mask if this was something like, you know, airborne or droplet precautions, right? So that's why that's wrong. And then look at four, wear a gown and gloves, good. To change the bed linens, look, look at the rest of it. And gloves only for the bath. First of all, that word only should have tipped you off that this is the wrong answer choice because what did I tell you about only and never and always and all? stay away from them. Stay away from them unless you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's the answer. And guess what? Usually that is not the right answer. Okay, so the correct answer here, again, guys, we've got an open draining wound. Um, we're going to wear a gown and gloves. 
a client suspected of having systemic lupus erythematis. The nurse monitors a client knowing that which of the following is one of the initial characteristic signs of systemic lupus erythematis. One, weight gain. Two, subnormal temperature. Three, elevated RBCs. Or four, rash on the face across the bridge of the nose and on the cheeks. And guys, the correct answer is four. That rash um, on the face, across the nose and cheeks, what's that known as? The butterfly rash. And that is characteristic of uh, lupus. Absolutely characteristic of lupus. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, weight gain. Weight gain absolutely can and often occurs in lupus. Think about it. The patient has lupus, they're gonna be on um, steroids, that's gonna make them gain weight. Um, kidney dysfunction is declining, that's gonna make them weight, uh, gain weight. But the question, when you go back to the question and ask about initial, so one of the first things you're gonna see, all right, and it asks about characteristic. Characteristic means as soon as you see this, you think of this. As soon as you see that, you think of that. So something characteristic, that, that butterfly rash is characteristic. As soon as you see a butterfly rash, what is the first thing you're thinking of? Lupus right? But weight gain really can be attributed to so many things. Uh, choice two, um, subnormal temperature. If anything with lupus, we're not going to see a subnormal temperature. We're going to see what? Something like a fever. The temperature is going to be high, not low. So that's wrong. Choice three, elevated RBC. If you know anything about lupus, that patient's going to be what? Anemic. The RBC is going to be what? Decreased. And then choice four, which is a correct answer. Again, butterfly rash, that is characteristic. And that's one of the initial signs that you'll see. The nurse provides home care instructions to a client with lupus and tells the client about methods to manage fatigue. Which statement by the client indicates a need for further teaching? One, I should take hot baths because they're relaxing. Two, I should sit whenever possible to conserve my energy. Three, I should avoid long periods of rest because it causes joint stiffness. Or four, I should do some exercises such as walking when I'm fatigued. And the correct answer is one, because remember, we're looking for the wrong answer. When you look at the question, it said further instructions. That means the patient didn't understand it the first time, so we have to offer further instructions. Number one is wrong. I should take hot baths because they're relaxing. No, guess what heat does to the patient? It exacerbates fatigue. And if you know anything about lupus, it's going to make that patient very, very tired. Lupus is an autoimmune disorder, and one of the clinical manifestations is fatigue. We want to decrease um, fatigue. So we're not going to have them in the heat. We're not going to have them take hot baths. Choices number two, three, and four are absolutely correct. And those can help decrease fatigue. And choice number four, I know some of you guys it may have tricked you where it says I should do some exercises because you're thinking, okay, exercising is going to fatigue, but look, exercises such as walking, that's a low impact exercise. And so you absolutely are going to patient the um, encourage the patient to do low impact exercises because you don't want them to be stiff, right? You don't want circulation to be decreased. You want them to move around, but you just don't want them doing too much to the point that they're fatigued. The client with AIDS has respiratory infection from pneumocystitis divorcee and a nursing diagnosis of gas exchange impaired impaired written in the plan of care. Which of the following indicates that the expected outcome of care has not yet been achieved? One, client limits fluid intake. Two, client has clear breath sounds. Three, client expectorates secretions easily. Or four, client is free of complaints of shortness of breath. Even if you didn't know what the answer was, you should have noticed that choice two, three, and four are all good things, right? Choice number one is only the bad thing, client limits fluid intake. There are very few disorders where we wanna limit fluid intake. Something like, you know, if patient probably, you know, has a CHF exacerbation, or um, they've got um, SIADH, they're, always, they're already holding on to all their fluids, something like that. But normally you want patients to increase fluid intake. So the fact that they've got um, 
numerous societies divorcing and they're limiting their fluid intake. That's a problem because you're not drinking lots of fluids. How are you going to thin out those secretions? right? How are you going to break up those secretions if you're not drinking fluids? So that's the correct answer choice. Number two, three, and four are all wonderful outcomes for this type of diagnosis. A client with pemphigus is being seen in the clinic regularly. The nurse plans care based on which of the following descriptions of this condition. One, the absence of tiny vesicles. Two, an autoimmune disease that causes blistering of the epidermis. Three, the presence of skin vesicles found along the nerve caused by a virus. Or four, the presence of red raised papules and large plaques covered by silvery scales. And guys, the correct answer is two, an autoimmune disease that causes blistering in the epidermis. And so let me be more specific because this is true. It causes blistering in the skin. But where we see this the most, guys, is like um, skin around the mouth and the genitals. That's where we see uh, those blisters. That's the correct answer. Now, let's look at the wrong choices. One the presence of tiny red vesicles. That could be anything. You see a skin rash, those would be tiny red vesicles. Choice three, the presence of skin vesicles found along the nerve caused by a virus. They gave us so many clues to know that they're talking about what? Shingles, herpes virus. First of all, when you see the word vesicles, usually it's viral infection, right? But here's what made us know that we're, they're talking about herpes singles. Um, um, herpes zoster, also known as shingles, presence of skin vesicles along the nerve. The minute you see those vesicles along the nerve or along the nerve root, you know that most likely they're talking about uh, shingles or herpes zoster. And last, the presence of red raised papules and large plaques covered by silvery scales. What's that? Psoriasis. The minute you see silvery scales, I want you to think about psoriasis because most of the time that's what they're talking about. The client is brought to the emergency room and is experiencing an anaphylactic reaction from eating shellfish. The nurse implements which immediate action? One, maintaining patent airway. Two, administering a corticosteroid. Three, administering epinephrine. Or four, instructing the client on the importance of obtaining a medic alert bracelet. And guys, the correct answer is number one. Number one, because who cares about anything else if that patient's dead because they couldn't breathe, right? We want to maintain a patent airway. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. Two, administering a cortical steroid. If something like this happens, the patient um, is having an anaphylactic re reaction from shellfish, we do expect cortical steroids to be given. It decreases inflammation. But our first priority, right, is to maintain a patent airway because who cares about the inflammation if they're dead? Who cares about that inflammation if they're not breathing? Choice um, number three, administering epinephrine. Absolutely. Absolutely. We expect epinephrine to be administered. Why? To open up the airway. So that still leads us to number one. We're doing number three to accomplish number one, right? So number one still the answer. And then choice four, teaching about medical blood bracelet. We're going to do that down the line after the patient has been stabilized. But whenever you get a question about priority, teaching, psychosocial issues, anxiety, all of that, that's never going to be a priority. Priority is always going to be keeping your patient alive. So everything that falls under physiological, right, such as airway, breathing, circulation, nutrition, fluid electrolytes, you know, dehydration, um, vital signs, anything that physically keeps your patient alive, that is always going to be your priority. The nurse is assisting in planning care for a client with a diagnosis of immunodeficiency. The nurse would incorporate which of the following as priority for the plan of care. One, protecting the client from infection. Two, providing emotional support to decrease fear. Three, encouraging discussion about lifestyle changes. Or four, identifying factors that decrease the immune function. And guys, the correct answer is one, protecting the client from infection. Go back to the question. What is our problem? Immunodeficiency. They are at high risk for infection. So your priority is going to be to protect the patient from infection. That's going to be your number one priority. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. Two, providing emotional support. 
I just told you in the last question, when it comes to education, when it comes to psychosocial feelings, anxiety, all of that, that's later down the road. What takes um, priority is always going to be keeping our patient alive. In this case, the patient's problem is what? Immunodeficiency. So our, our goal is going to be to protect them from infection so they don't die. Choice three, encouraging discussion of lifetime, lifestyle changes. That's teaching. I told you teaching um, that doesn't take priority over physiological integrity. And then choice four, that's another teaching, identifying factors. Teaching, feelings, psychosocial, all of that comes later. Our priority is always going to be to keep our patient alive and to keep them safe, protect them from injury. A client calls a nurse in the emergency room and tells the nurse that he was just stung by a bumblebee while gardening. The client's afraid of a severe reaction because a client's neighbor experienced such a reaction just a week ago. The appropriate nursing action is to one, advise the client to soak the site in hydrogen peroxide. Two, ask the client if he ever sustained a bee sting in the past. Three, tell the client to call the ambulance for transport to the emergency room. Or four, tell the client not to worry about the sting unless difficulty in breathing occurs. And the first thing you're gonna do is get information, add pie. What's the first part of the ad pie assess? You're going to ask, number two, you're gonna ask the client if they ever sustained a bee sting in the past. Why is that important? In order for you to have an allergic reaction, you have to have been exposed to um, that pathogen first, right? So you have to have been exposed first, develop antibodies, and then the next time around you have a reaction. So you need to find out, have you ever been stung by a bee before? And if you have, what happened? So us being concerned about that patient possibly having an anaphylactic reaction, we need to know, have they ever been stung by a bee before? Because we need to know if there, it's possible that, you know, they have, um, um, that they have those antibodies, but that now they can actually have an anaphylactic reaction. That's why. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, advise them to soak the site in hydrogen peroxide. <sighs> that's not smart. What's that going to do? So that's wrong. Choice uh, three, telling them to call the ambulance. We're not there yet. We need information. We're going to tell them to call an ambulance just because they got stung by a bee. That makes absolutely no sense. And then four, tell them not to work. You know, in nursing, we never give false reassurance. We never reassure. We never say, don't worry. We never ask, we never say to them, what made you? We never say why. So telling a patient, don't worry, we know that's wrong. So the correct answer choice here is number two. The nurse is assisting in administering immunizations at a healthcare clinic. The nurse understands that an immunization will provide one, protection from all diseases, two, innate immunity from disease, three, natural immunity from disease, or four, acquired immunity from disease. What do you guys think? And the correct answer is four, acquired immunity from disease. So it helps your body to um, or forces your body, I should say, to create antibodies against that pathogen. And that's what um, we understand um, that to be, that's acquired immunity. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, protection from all. The minute you saw all, you should have known that was the wrong answer. Again, guys, again, those all inclusive, such as all, always, none, never, stay away from them. Do not choose that as your answer if you know, unless you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that's the answer. Usually that's not the answer. Choice um, two and choice three, actually, innate immunity and natural immunity, those are both the same thing. And this is a multiple choice. So you should have been able to rule that out just by seeing that those two are the same thing where the, the patient's actually born with that immunity. So that can't be the answer. And it leads us to the correct answer. Choice number four, acquired immunity, where you're making your own antibodies after being exposed. 
The community health nurse is conducting a research study and is identifying clients in the community at risk for latex allergy. Which client population is at most risk for developing this type of allergy? Would it be a hairdresser, a homeless person, a child in a daycare center, or someone living in a group home? The correct answer choice is going to be the hairdresser. Why? People who are at highest risk for developing an allergy to latex is going to be those who are most exposed to latex. So someone who's a hairdresser who's doing perms or coloring all the time, they may be wearing latex gloves. Or someone who works in a restaurant that's preparing food all the time that's always wearing latex gloves. Or um, um, someone who works in the medical field, right? Maybe always wearing latex gloves or someone else who's high risk, someone who's sick all the time that's always getting multiple surgeries. And guess what? When you're being, when surgery is being performed on you, these people are wearing latex gloves. So those type of people that are in, um, that are exposed often to latex, they're the ones at highest risk for developing latex allergy. And so that's why the hairdresser number one is the correct answer choice. And guys, we're down to our last question. The home care nurse is performing an assessment on a client who's been diagnosed with an allergy to latex. In determining the client's risk factors associated with the allergy, the nurse questions the client about an allergy to which item? Eggs, milk, yogurt, or bananas? And the correct answer is bananas. So there is um, a type of protein, I don't know the name, but it's a type of protein that's found in certain foods that is also found in latex. So if the, per if the patient is allergic to those type of foods, they may likely be allergic to latex. And so that includes foods like um, bananas, pineapples, avocados, uh, hazelnut, tropical fruits. So if they're allergic to those type of foods, they may, it, there's a high chance that they're also allergic to latex. And guys, that's the end of the video. Please let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover next or more in depth. Um, let me know how you'd like me to present the information. Do you like it like this question answer? Do you want a Kahoot? Would you like a lecture? And something else, guys, don't forget, almost daily you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics on my other social media platforms. So please be sure to check me out on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Don't forget, I'm now offering Next Generation NCLEX reviews and one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. You can reserve your spot right now by going to my website, Nexus Nursing Institute. Institute.com. And while you're there, check out the audio lessons I have available. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. You guys catch me on the next video.